Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 151 for Monday, January 29th, 2018. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Las Gatas, California, it's Paul Kent. How you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? You sound like you got a little bit of a cold. A little bit. Yeah, it's, it's you know, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough to slow you down? No, not yet. I'm hoping it doesn't get there. So, we'll, yeah. yeah, just, um, yeah, it's a little sinusy thing going on, but no, no big deal. That's, at least not yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you watch the Grammys last night? I watched about half of them. Um, and then my daughter went to bed and uh, we'll finish watching the second half tonight. So, yeah. I, Bruno kind of owns the world right now. <laughs> Bruno's been owning the world for a little while now. Well, he's real good, man. I mean, he's, he's you know, James Brown, you know, Stevie Wonder. You know, he's where all, all those, yep. yeah, it, it all comes together right there. And, yep. you know, it's kind of cool that there's a band always on stage with him playing real music and, and, uh, mm. you know, crazy talented cat. I mean, the guy just lays it out there it's, and I've not seen him live, but a bunch of guys in my band have seen him live and say it's the best live show that they've seen. It's, he, it's a good live show. I've seen him twice. Um, I think I mentioned the second time we saw him most recently, the sound at the Boston garden was, was, uh, was pretty muddy. So, so that part of it was sort of a drag, but, um, but the performance and the, I mean, it, it's it, what you saw on the Grammys happens all night long. For, yeah. All which is fantastic. Long. Oh, I like the energy that those guys pour out all of them. It really, you know, it, it, one nice thing about going to see Bruno is you really are going to see a band put on a show. Um, right. it, you know, it, it's not unlike going to see like your band, right? I mean, it's a big band. There's different sections to the band, but everybody is in this band together. And yeah, there's a lead singer and like those sorts of things. But, but the, the vibe of it being this band of, of people on stage is very much, it's not a solo artist with a backing band. By not by any stretch um, ensemble. It is mu very much an ensemble. Yeah. And, uh, and, and um, Bruno's drummer is actually his brother. Uh, oh, always always has that. been. And he's a killer drummer. Like he didn't, I, I mean, I'm sure he got the gig cause you know, he knew Bruno from what growing up with him, but um, well, they had a family act he, growing up from yeah, what I understand. That's right. Why. That's right. Yeah. Have you ever seen the, the Thomas shows, you know, the famous Thomas shows from the, the, the early the 60s? Tammy show you mean? Yeah. 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 And if you've seen James Brown's performance in those, right? Like the, the Rolling Stones are known for those as well. But, you know, the story was, that, you know, James Brown just blew the world away in those. Same tape I've had for years, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the peak of, of performance, I think. You it, know, it is. And I, yeah. I, I, I love Springsteen and, you know, think that those are great shows. And, you know, they, they do something for me still after all these years. Sure. But the visceral, nasty sex, you know, energy testosterone the most i've ever seen is, is james brown yeah well bruno i never saw james brown but i mean i watched the the tammy show um but you 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 th like you get that from bruno for sure yeah. like yeah. for sure it's a but it's a different testosterone than james brown uh, well it's a modernized version of it right it, it you a, know the way metro, that the dance like is a, so choreographed and yeah it's like a metrosexual version of it like he's, he's <laughs> you know what i mean like like he's i don't know what you mean he's less <laughs> he's i mean he he it's there's very much this masculine energy on stage but but he's such kind of a softy that it, uh, it like he, he he blends those two things and his charisma is stellar um yeah, it's really quite something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so so all this, uh, you know, Bruno Love, the, our band, Nick, you know, is really into getting further into some songs. So we've been working on 24 Karat. He wants to do finesse. And so yeah. there's, yeah, but I mean, at the end of the day, a pretty interesting question. Is there a limit to how many songs you can do by one artist in a, in a show without it getting weird? Or do just people like the music and they just, they just want to... They don't care if, it, if it's stuff they like to dance to. They don't go, oh, here's another. They're doing another song by so-and-so. I don't think so. I mean, when I played in the Responders, 
you know, if we did, let's say we did, you know, 40 songs on a on a three set night, just for the sake of argument, um, it like if 12 of those were Beatles tunes and 12 of them were Stones tunes, that was not totally out of out of uh, out of the uh. question. Yeah, we, we did have a rule that we didn't always get right. But uh, in building the set list, we tried not to do more than two songs in a row by the same artist, which obviously yeah. with, with that many, you know, we probably had 20, we could have done a night of just Beatles and stones, you know, but so, so, you know, we'd have to pick and choose and, and pepper some things. And we did, you know, the birds and Tom Petty and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, Elvis Costello. We had all kinds of yeah. stuff in the set list, but um, yeah. So it was always no more than two kind of paired up, but two paired up from, Especially bands like that. I mean, the Beatles and the Stones, like, you know, and, and Bruno Mars, I think, especially for the kind of the, the crowd that you guys play for, uh, like that, that's going to go over pretty well, I think. That is, that, that is top 40, right? You keep that energy going, right? It's that same vibe and, and yeah. you can really kind of milk that. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I um I did a theater gig this week. Um it completely packed in between the last time we talked and this time, like from soup to nuts. Uh we oh, we had rehearsals Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and performances Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um and then that was that. And it was at the Seacoast Rep where I've played before. That's where I did Rocky and and we do all our madhouses and and all that stuff. Um it was it was the first, well, Rocky technically was the first one that I did this way, but it was the first time that I was up in the new pit that they have. Um, and it's completely like, I have zero view of the stage from this pit that, that they have. It's, it's not a pit under the stage. It's a pit actually way up in one of the corners of the room. And, um, and just from where I am in there, all I see is other, other members of the pit. And it, I didn't like it. To be brutally honest, I, I sort of noticed it during Rocky, but we didn't have like exhaustive rehearsals or anything for, for Rocky. I mean, we ran it once and it was like, yeah, OK, good, great. It's just rock tunes. Like, let's go. Um, it, it got really uh, old, I'll say, being, being up there and not being able to interact. Uh, you know, I mean, you know this about me. One of the things that I love about playing music is interacting with the people with whom I'm, I'm playing and, and a, even in a, a supportive role, which is what theater is for the most part. Anyway, uh, there's like, you know, I'm supporting these people in a, in a visceral way. Like if they're dancing, I like to watch their feet so that I make sure we're in sync and you know, all of that stuff. And so only hearing them in my ears, uh, was really, really weird. Mm -hmm. And, and I, and I, I really didn't like it. Like, I, I don't think I'll take another gig, where I'm that disconnected. And I mentioned this a couple of years ago, I think when I, I did a, a theater show where we were completely uh, behind the stage and yeah. I, I walked out and realized all these people that were walking to their cars with me were the people that I had just performed for. And, and I never saw one of them. Um, yeah, it was just, it was weird, but it, you know, it's one of those things you learn. It's like, okay. And I, I mean, that's very traditional theater, right? There's lots of Broadway shows that you can go see and you, sure. you never see the band. Um, that, that won't, I don't think that'll be me. I mean, you know, I, I, I never say never, right? If the, if an opportunity comes along where the pros outweigh the cons, okay, great. No problem. But. Well, you know, that's similar to like my vibe about really preferring not to do restaurant gigs where there are clinking plates and clinking glasses and just a constant din. Yeah. You, you know, you and I have the luxury to some degree to mm -hmm. be selective that the gig has to be the right gig. Absolutely. Oh, no, it's totally a luxury. That's right. Well, as uh, you know, I mentioned this to several people sort of at the theater in the production and, and people that, you know, the administration of the theater. And I, I mean, it was a, you know, all very cordial conversation. It was like, Oh, I'm just realizing this about myself. And, <laughs> um, and, and one of them, my a friend of mine that uh, sometimes plays bass in these things, but really just works at the theater uh, for the most part. He said, well, you know, you're you're not getting paid. I said, I get the 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 I grok the fact that this is a job and and there's there was no pretense about this. Right. It's like this is where you're going to be. And you signed mm -hmm. you signed up. And I like I know that there's no it's, it wasn't like there was no bait and switch here. Right. Um, and he and I was saying, saying that to him and he said, well, yeah, but, you know, you're not really being paid to do a job. He said you're being paid to enjoy doing something that you that we need you to do 
He's like, there's a difference. <laughs> He's like, and, and it's like, oh, that's right. Yeah. Like this is supposed to be enjoyable for everyone. And yeah, we can make, you know, a little bit of money, um, but nobody's getting rich, you know, playing in regional theater. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But, but it is kind of that, that interesting thing that goes along to the conversation between the professional, the semi-professional, the weekend warrior, you know, the professional at a local level who's, who's putting food on his, on his table by gigging totally has a completely different optic to it. Right. Uh, completely. And, then, and I'm sensitive to that, you, you know, and, and, and one of them might be sitting right next to me in the pit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, and that's an interesting, it's, that's an interesting dynamic because that guy is saying, Hey, I don't care about your enjoyment. You know, nope. I, this is my living. Right. And in that, you know, you have the weekend warriors and whereas we talk about the guys who are weekend warriors, imagine how, how frustrating, insulting it would be to a, to a full-time professional. If the guy next to him, a will take the gig just to show off, you know, for $25 yeah, yeah, or, yeah. or, and expects to be happy doing it. Right. Right. You know, right. You know, it just imagine that when you get down to like the blue collar aspects of being a professional musician and you're doing what you can to provide for yourself and your family. And then you're kind of cluttered in this, in this marketplace where semi-professionals can kind of muddy the waters. Oh yeah. And no, I, I think this I'm, is again, I'm why, very, I'm very sensitive to that. And I like, yeah. I never would, make these complaints in that way to the other musicians you, you, you know like you, like you do you I'll do me when we're doing our thing together we both rely on each other to simply be professional yeah and that's it be professional yeah that's it. I, I would imagine that the line is we it would be really cool to hear some people kind of chime in on yeah. our on our various social media things but I would imagine that the main thing that the professional musicians want, this is what I've heard from my friends who are local professional musicians, full-time musicians, is that just don't, you know, muck up the pay scale in the area, right? Yes. Don't don't say I can take this gig away from this pro because we'll do it for free because I'm just I'm just happy to play. Right. Yeah. That just it just brings the qualitative level down everywhere and it brings a you know, that brings the pay scale down. Yep. Here's That's the true. flip side of that. Yeah. yeah. So in, in I, theater, um, though, it, it's interesting because there's different, different vibe, a different. Well, and, and the pay scale is not necessarily the same. Uh, mm. I've been in pits where I am the highest paid person in the pit and we're all there for the same amount of time. Uh, yep. I've also been in pits where I don't know if I've been in a pit where I'm the lowest paid person, but I know I've been in a pit. In fact, I over the summer, I was in a pit where one of the guys like they needed a, a certain type of instrument and this guy happened to play it and he said, OK, yep, but I need, you know, one hundred and twenty five bucks a gig when everybody else was getting like 50 or 75. And they said, OK, like, we'll yeah. we'll pay you. Right. Yeah. So it it's a it, so generally the conversation about pay does not happen amongst the musicians just to avoid anybody that. feeling like, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, well, I mean, like when I hear that, like that, you know, that dude's getting, you know, twice as much as me or sometimes even like one of them is like even more it's like, well, that's on me to be, you know, a better negotiator next time. <laughs> yeah. That's so it. I'll tell you, you know, there's a gig that uh, the house rockers have done for about 13 years regularly. Yeah. And it's a gig I like, and it's a gig that's fun, but it's paid not well. Right. Mm -hmm. I've actually gone into pocket to get out of pocket to give my band a minimum. Right. Sure. Um, but it's a gig that I've wanted and we not, then it became something that has become a yearly regular thing. And I, I like those types of things. And, you know, I've made sure that the band has gotten the minimum on that. And finally this year came up and I decided to say something and I was like, you know, I love the gig. Um, it's all sorts of great, but I just got to be frank. You know, it's really for a 10 piece band. It's the scale is just not going to work. Yeah. And, uh, so I made a request and they said, yep. <laughs> I mean, it was like no discussion. I mean, sometimes it's just asking and, and, and the point I'm getting to with this and I was going to get to with some of my solo stuff is I actually find that, um, well, again, this may be my, my myopic view of the world, but one way to achieve any kind of goal is insisting on it, right? So setting a bar sure. and kind of dealing with that, right? So yeah. I'm actually finding that that I'm I'm finding the gigs that are inclined to pay a little bit better, you know? So I have two 
pretty, pretty top scale solo acoustic gigs, you know, that, you know, and then when tips are added on top of that, it's actually a very good paying night, like right. by any scale. Right. Right. And I, I, I don't think that those are the only two in the world. Right. And so, you know, some of it, some of it is insisting on a certain pay. Well, and it's your some mindset. Of it, some of it is, it's your mindset. Some of it is seeking it out. Yep. Um, you know, you have to be worth it and you have to deliver the goods and the goods is playing great, performing great and bringing a crowd with you. So everybody yeah. makes money. Yeah. Right. Right. Being you know, that, realistic that's just the reality. About, yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, but, but again, it's not, it's not possible that those are the only two gigs in the entire Bay area that uh, are going to pay that scale. There's more. There's and I definitely want to more. Them. And you'll find yeah. them or somebody else will, or, or, I mean, it's, it, I mean, there's many nights at these places. Many people can find them. Yeah. Yeah. That's you, good. I, yeah. I definitely subscribe to the concept. You teach people how to treat you. You do for, for the most part. I mean, sometimes you run into a jackass that's just a jackass, but. Uh, and you just draw, you just and you draw, draw a boundary and you say, no, thank you. And, and, you know, you don't need that unless you really need that. And again, we have to be really sensitive because there is there, there is that component of fighting to make a living. Although, you know, actually it's just that coming out of my mouth. The guys in my band who are full-time musicians, they don't put up with any crap. Actually, they, they will walk away. I mean, and then maybe, maybe that's a difference. Like you and I having owned businesses and building businesses and doing some things that we know now X amount of years into owning a business that we probably wouldn't advise the younger selves, you know, to do, yes. oh, but, yeah. you know, when you're starting out, you put up with, you know, a certain amount of, of guff. And then in, as, as time goes on, you decide what crap is worth putting up with. Right. If yeah. Any. You learn, like you said, yeah, you learn for yourself. And then, and then once you know, then you start to teach others how you're, how you want to be treated, how you will be treated. And I don't mean to yes. say that egotistically. It's just like, no, this needs to be a mutually acceptable and preferably mutually beneficial scenario. Yeah. And there's, it's not just money, right? I mean, there's all kinds of things. We talk about that here all the time. Like, in fact, you know, this, this conversation started with, it wasn't about the money. I didn't enjoy the gig. Cause I didn't, I mean, I, to say that I didn't enjoy it is the wrong way, but you know, it, it wasn't as fulfilling as I would want it to be in order to sure. dedicate half a week to, of my life to it. Uh, you know, it's like, Oh, there's other things that I kind of am putting on the back burner uh, to do this. And so, you know, you got to check enough of your boxes, whatever your boxes are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, um, sure. and, to, and to add to the frustration for this gig, man, this score, it was a show called a new brain. And it had really, really complex music, um, it, like so much so that we all had to be super focused. And the first time we ran it together, like everybody, including the cast, totally misunderestimated the show. Right. I mean, it was just like, uh oh, this is way <laughs> bigger than we thought it was going to be. OK, like we were kind of crazy to think just we, complex music to get through complex music, complex choreography, complex everything. Yeah. But the, but the music, even just taking that separately from everything else, the music extremely complex. Yeah. And, and shifting time signatures and, and shifting um, tempos and, and nonstop. I, I mean, it, we would play, there, there was almost no solo dialogue in this. It was all just one song after the other and basically mm -hmm. segues. Yeah. Um, so, and it was a hundred and it, so the, it's a one act musical. We turned it into a two act by adding a song. Uh, but it was a, a one act musical, which generally runs about 90 minutes. The longest drum book I've ever had. It was like 120 pages or something. You know, most musicals are 80 to a hundred for a two act. So, so, and very complex, uh, required a lot of thinking. And the first time we played through it was like a disaster Th because we were doing it with the cast. Um, thankfully the piano player, who's our musical director had been playing it with the cast through all the rehearsals, which is sort of standard. So we, I mean, as pros and all of us were, we know that if there's some, you know, train wreck about to happen, you just stop, let him uh -huh. keep doing what he's doing. Cause he, he and the cast are already in sync and then sort of figure it out afterwards. So first time through, we sort of expected it to be a, a you know, a lot of train wrecks and it was. And then the second time through, it's like still like that. And finally, at the third rehearsal, you know, this is just a couple hours before we're opening. We we took some time actually between the third rehearsal and and when we opened that night, we had a couple hours for a dinner break. And I said, now there's some of these things we got to go through. So 
Um, so we went through a couple of them and we just like Julius, the, the, the music director, the piano player would get to a spot before me. I'm like, how am I miscounting this? I'm not that bad. You know, I kind of know what I'm doing here. And, uh, and, and he's like, okay, well let's, you know, let's, uh, he's like, where do you want to start from? I said, well, let's just start again at the top of the song, you know, measure one. He's like, well, you mean measure five. And I'm like, no, no measure one. He's like, no, I don't. My book doesn't have measures one through four. And it was like, oh, well, that that sort of explains everything about what's happening here. And then we found four or five other places in the book, like the, the problem spots that, that we knew about. I'm like, all right, this, wh- you know, what do you have? He's like, oh, yeah, I'm missing measures 210 and 211 there. <laughs> it's like, well, I mean, like, what the hell? I don't add to the complexity. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that actually gave us more confidence because it was like, all right, we actually do know what we're doing more than we were led to believe. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, and I'm sure there were others that we never found, you know, throughout the run but it was enough we cleaned up the worst trouble spots but i've never seen that before where it was just like this blatant missing stuff it's crazy crazy well this brings to mind how we're trying to get russ up to speed in the house rockers right so we don't do too much that's straight off the record right we've done stuff to songs stretch songs change songs mashed up and um we don't have a great audio history of the band and we don't have a great we have we don't have a great video history. Sure. We have horn charts, you know, which a lot of drummers read horn charts. Those have been a little bit helpful, but you know, this poor guy, we are just dragging him up and down the mountains and valleys, sure. you know, trying to teach him our stuff. And sometimes he has to take hand notes as we go along and, you know, he's been a great sport about it. Uh, it I guess there's a lesson in there, like part of running your business of having, and, and, you know, like, like the really, Bands who have their act together. I'm thinking about a lot of the really good corporate bands in my area. Yeah, they don't. They don't even. You know, between the wigs and the and the sunglasses and the and the costumes, it's often not the same people. But they have their business process together. Where if someone's going to sub, so they've got their first subs, their second subs, their third subs at every position. Right. They've got their book down, and your business can go on independently of some of the things that are going on. It's not a bad lesson. You know, it's not the most creative endeavor in the world. Sure, to it like becomes document less creative. your band. Yeah, yeah, right. and, you know, and but uh, it makes sense. And for every band out there, you're probably going to replace somebody at some point along the line. I would say uh, for the house rockers, you know, getting Russ integrated, he's working his tail off. We were not prepared enough, you know, to give him like, do this and then we can go on. Right. Luckily he did those sub gigs with us. And so he just learned by experience. But uh, you know, if the definition of having your act together is that, you know, you're ready for the, for the next time you have to change a person at any position at the very least, you should have recordings of your shows, right? That's, that's that, the simplest one. That would be the, the easiest, yes, one to check the box with. That's right. Yeah. Yep. And then video, helpful as well, especially if there's performance aspects of what you're doing. Totally. And then, and then you know, lead sheets, you know, for your songs, you know, should happen. Yeah. So lead that's lead what sheets good are really like. helpful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so that's what you needed for your theater gig. Oh, I, well, I had it. I mean, I literally a master blueprints, the yeah. one that everyone agreed to. That's the problem. And, you know, they pay to rent these. I mean, when they when they when you mount a show that someone else wrote and therefore someone else owns, you get a book, you get a book. It, yeah. the, the assumption is that the book is consistent. Is right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's one thing, and this happens too, where, you know, in the sort of pre-band process, when it's just the MD, the music director working with the cast, they'll decide, okay, well, based on the way we're choreographing this show, we either need three extra measures here or five less measures at this particular point. But but that's you know, the music director makes those notes. And then the day before the first rehearsal, and that's what happened with this one, is, you know, Julia sent out like a three page email that had all of those cuts and changes and, you know, sure. vamp here and safety there and this. That. And it's like, OK, great. That makes it easy because then we all sit down and in theory, we're all now working from the same book. And except when you figure out, no, but yeah, so it was, it was interesting. Um, <laughs> one, one other thing happened that I think is a relevant lesson for all of us, no matter what kind of music we play. We talk a lot about uh, pricing our, our shows, right? I mean, sometimes the club chooses the, the cover charge or whatever, but sometimes you choose it. And then certainly if you're putting on your own event, you, you definitely choose it. And 
with this one, it came to be about, I think it might've been Tuesday night, early Wednesday morning. And there were only three performances of this, this show Thursday night was the opening. And I, you know, at that point, I think there were, you know, like 25 or 30 tickets sold. Now there's pre-sales and then there's walk-ups and there's, there's usually a substantial number of walk-ups, but this is for a theater that holds 250 plus. So, yeah. um, so the, the, the powers that be at the theater decided, okay, Hey, wait, you know, we need people in this room, a, because it's more fun to put on a show with people in the room and B, if there's people there, you know, we have a bar where we can sell them booze and they'll talk about it. And maybe that'll help build the word for, you know, the rest of the weekend. So they did this thing. They said, hey, look, we, you know, were pretty honest about it. They weren't, you know, they didn't couch it in some weird way. They just said, hey, look, you know, the sales on Thursday are soft. Um, if you want to come see the show, just come pay what you can. And uh, and come see it. And if you can't pay anything, that's OK. And, you know, I think whatever, you know, tickets were somewhere between the 15 and twenty five dollars or 18 and twenty five or something like that, depending on where mm -hmm. the house you sat. And if you can't afford to pay full price, but you can pay 10 bucks for your ticket, just pay that. And yep. and, and, then, and then they also said, and if, you know, you can pay a little more. Well, we'll take that, too. Like, that's OK. Whatever works, we'll do it. Interesting. And. On Thursday night, we had 37 tickets sold before we opened the house. Um, by the time we started, we had a hundred and almost 150 people in the in the house. So a very you know respectable size crowd. Definitely. Yep. And I found out that our average had we sold every seat that someone was in at face value, it, the average would have been 20 bucks, right for per per person. Our average was 21, which is pretty interesting. And they did it the next night and the following night. And we sold out Friday and Saturday. And our averages for those nights were more than they would have been if we had sold every ticket for face value, huh. which is really interesting. And so I posted about this. I actually, I shared the post that the theater had done. I shared it on Facebook. And I got a message from uh, a guy down in Texas who who actually tours all over the country and plays a lot. And he says, oh, yeah, man, I did that with my merch table, started doing it years ago. And I still do. He says, I make way more selling my merch for whatever price people want to pay wow. versus me setting the prices. That's so cool. And, you know, it there's makes, so much to learn in that. So much to deconstruct in that. I know. <laughs> it makes I mean, sense. Right. Because it does. Well, you know, it's almost... It's almost the premise of tipping, right? I mean, you can kind of dot the line to that. Yeah, is that totally. you know, instead of imposing a value, which people say, "Okay, I paid my, I paid what they mm -hmm. asked," right? right? If you know that your audience has some elastic, so so let's actually back up here. Pricing things is a science. There's many things that have been written about pricing. There's you know, there's there's a whole world of people who are employed to figure out pricing models for all types of businesses and all types of services all over the world, right? Totally. So, Pricing is is a thing. It is a it is a psychological yep. exploration to a great degree, it, right? That's exactly what it is. Yeah, that's right. So it makes sense to to think about. And again, I, I'm thought I'm thinking it's very much similar to tipping. So when I charge, when you charge an admission, and you're saying here is the price. Uh, well, actually, let me back up here. If if the patient perceives that the admission is going to the club and the poor band isn't getting their value or makes a request or something like that, they, they may be com compelled to tip. Right. But, you know, like when 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 I put on shows and I set a, a ticket value, um, you know, I'm trying to create some certainty in my life that I know I have inventory of X. And if I sell it at Y, I can, you know, tell the guys what I'm going to pay them at the end of the night. But if you set, if you suspend that for a second and you just kind of think about you're creating a vibe that has a lot of goodwill and you're going to deliver a, a, a service that is meaningful to people. Yep. Doesn't it make sense to look at ways that people can ascribe their own value to that meaning? Well, that's it. People have an intrinsic sense of what this is worth to them. Right. Yep. And 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 I don't like I mean, other than, you know, some sociopaths out there or whatever, like most people are going to say, yeah, they're like it's worth some amount of, of dollars to, you know, to trade for 
experiencing this art that you are showing me or in the yeah. in the case of merchandise, you know, in this art that I am literally taking with me. Like nobody thinks that free is the right number. I don't want to say right. nobody, but you know, it's more about being compelled. It's, compelled, you know, like, yeah, yeah. That's where you. That's where people get a little bit weird. You know, yep. that's where people try to beat a cover charge. And yeah, all those types of things. But it is such an interesting thing. We've we've got you in a room, and now we have a bunch of goods and services: t-shirts, coasters, music. Right, right. <laughs> you know, yeah. live music. Yeah. So you know, we're gonna do what we can to make you happy, and uh, you see this. At play, I don't know if you ever have this, but do you have anybody who follows any of the any of the musical endeavors you have who will take the tip jar out into the audience for you? Yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That is where you see this at work, yep. right? Yep. You really see. So I know Acoustic Madness played uh, a meaningful song. The guy was out uh, on a date with a girl and he really needed to hear a song. He emptied his wallet and tipped us three hundred dollars for one song. <laughs> Yeah, I love those moments. I don't have enough and, of and, them, but I love those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I definitely have seen when you make a truly make an emotional connection with people with some music you play, value is through the roof. I mean, oh, you know, the, people, people are so people they want to right. they want to yeah they want to they want to that's the way that they connect to that value by by participating in it. Yep. And there's a whole like I said, there's a whole science to pricing, right? But I love what you said, that merch. I mean, I would never have thought of that. No. It's the same thing. It's because you don't want the merch. The same thing. I know. You don't want you don't want to walk out of there with excess merch. You want as much gone as possible. So make it as easy as possible. Nobody's getting rich on this. So why don't you just start dragging down the barriers? Because your merch is a revenue play and it's a marketing play, to be honest, right? Yeah. And you know, so you want this merch out there. You want it to go. It is unbelievable what people will do. Um, and, and the, the dynamics of the group will drive it. So I don't think it's like, you, you don't have people saying, what, you mean I can have a t-shirt for a buck if that's all I really want to pay for it? It's, that's not the way people think. No, in that's not Some the way people, people do. Yeah. Some people do. And, and quite frankly, let they're me, not your best customers. Let me read what, what it, this is Griffin Lambeth. Who's a, uh, a guitar player plays. He's based down in Texas and he plays all over the place. And he said, um, I started, at a, it started for me at a show where I had no one to tend the merch and uh, there wasn't a good place to place it near the stage to set the case. So I put it in a bag with a sign that said, I like to get $10 an item, but if you wanted something, just take it and pay what you could. And uh, he says, I've banked more than I would have had I charged what was marked. He oh says, it, it, they, and he goes on to say, I'll say it depends on the audience and the venue and the geographical location sure. in the country. Uh, really interesting. Uh, just because I, I'm definitely going to do this with merch at the next uh, fling show. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to talk to the guys about it, you know? So guys, if you're listening, l let's talk about it. But, uh, but yeah. So think about this. What if you, what if you just let everybody into your show and yep. then you announce a couple stage from the stage and you say, Hey, you know, this is how we make our living, you know, pay us what you can on the way out. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Or have someone at the door to collect, the make night. it easy yeah. for them to do that. You know, and then remember if you're really smart about this, Make sure you can take Square Cash and and uh, and Venmo and all that type of stuff and put that stuff around and you know make it make it that way. Yeah. What an interesting experiment. I, I, I would love to hear if any of our listeners have have tried anything like this. Yeah. I wonder yeah. if you if you statistically net out more often better than you would have if you just go a traditional pricing model. How interesting. I I bet you would. I mean, you you know, to Griffin's point, you've got to sort of especially for. The the cover charge or whatever you want to call the price of the music, as opposed to the price of the T-shirts, um, you've got to adjust your pricing depending on where you're playing and, and your market and all that stuff. But you're going to do that anyway. Right. So why not just let it be natural, especially if you're touring around? You may not have a bet, uh, you know, the right sense of what people feel you have to know. Worth. Yeah. Yeah. Touring around would be a difficult would be a difficult thing to do if you know your audience and your audience knows you. Yeah. And you built up you know, a certain know, though, amount of trust. When we were on the road with the clam bake, we played a couple of gigs where we played for free. We would we would negotiate with the venue to maybe give us like food or something. And the only reason we did that, um, and this was all sort of set in motion before I joined the band, but it was it was explained to me. They're like, Yeah, if we walk in here and we're willing to play for nothing on an off night, that seems weird to these venues. So we go in and negotiate 
something that we know they can pay, you know, and sometimes it's cash, sometimes it's food, sometimes what, you know, whatever it is so that they feel like there's like something that's happening and we're professionals. Uh, and, and Maury said, but it doesn't matter if we get zero dollars or really nothing from them. He said, a, it gives us something to do for the night, which saves us money right out of the gate. And B, we can set up our merch table and, you know, and go make 500 bucks. And, and even in a town where we, you know, had never played before, that's what we would do. Now we'd pick to your point, we'd pick the right towns. We'd pick a college town. We'd get there early. We'd negotiate with whatever venue we were going to do it with. Then two of us would split off and go to the college radio station and pimp the gig there. Others would, you know, get some little posters made up or something. And, you know, like you, you do what you could to drag people to this gig. Um, but uh, but it was all about just getting people in the door because you knew some percentage of them were going to buy merch from you huh. and and so you made some money. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's crazy. Yeah. So you asked me a question about uh, about solo performing last time and kind of caught me with my you kind of floored me and I, and I just kind of paused for a second. Yeah. Cool. If we spend a couple seconds, just kind of drilling down on that. I I would have it. No other. I would love Re it. Yes. All right. So yeah. restate the question the way that you asked it the first time. Yeah. And and I didn't prep this exactly, so I might get it wrong, folks. Uh, but it was a, we were talking about the loneliness of a solo gig. And it was in the context of playing a, a non-solo, a, a trio, actually, acoustic gig that I played uh -huh. a week and a half ago or whatever. And it was that, you know, John actually turned to me and he's like, I, I don't know that I'd want to do the solo thing all the time because it's so lonely up on stage, at which point Matt said, yeah, you know, that's why I try and involve the crowd because otherwise, yeah, it's very lonely. So there's this psychological, you know, solo mentality I've never experienced. I mean, I've I've played alone on stage, but only for, you know, two to five songs in the midst of a gig that I was playing yeah. with other people. So that's totally different. Uh, totally different. Yeah. So the reason it floored me is because I had just recently done a gig that was lonely, okay. which is actually not the way most of them are. So uh, I guess you start with how are you wired? Like, do you take full accountability that your job is to own this and entertain people and connect with people and do this thing. Sure. And if you're wired that way, you know, if you're wired, like, yeah, you know, I'm going to play some, you know, nice music. It'll fill up the space and, you know, you'll have your conversations and you'll have a couple cocktails and I'll just fill up the space and everybody gets what they need and they go on. It's lonely when your expectations are shattered when they're <laughs> when it's, it's lonely when you know don't we all do this like you 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 envision a gig before you get to a gig how it's going to be how oh, songs are going to totally. get over yeah how great it's going to sound how 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 charming you're going to be right you, you know you you kind of have this <laughs> no you do whole it's right expectations so i did a gig at a really nice hotel i got called for this gig i got referred to it i got called i went and did my first one it was a wednesday night at a very nice downtown San Jose hotel. And uh, it is not, it, it was a big lobby bar. So big, big space sounded great, big space. But, you know, in there were kind of some bar flies, you know, coming through town a couple of, then a little bit later in the night, like a convention had let out and, you know, people came back from dinner. It was not about me at all. Right. And, um, and you're, I think I've wallpaper. I was. And oddly enough, not only was I wallpaper, I was right there kind of in the center of everything. Kind of like, you know, <laughs> you were, you were like, like wallpaper I would in would the say, way. Yeah. Yeah. I would say people say, what, you know, why is this guy here? Why is he trying so hard? You know, and um, that's lonely. So so that's lonely because it's a bruise to your ego. That's lonely because it's. Um, you're you are sent a, a pretty direct message that, that you're not as important as you think you are. Um, th those are, those are hard things. At least for me, those are hard things. I can, no, I can imagine that. Cause I mean, I've, I've experienced that with, you know, on stage with a band or an acoustic duo or trio or whatever, where it's clear, it's like, Oh, this is sort of the wrong vibe to have uh, whatever I am here. I'm not the right one. You know, like you should have had just music on the on the thing so that you weren't in the yep. way of these people. And when you know, when I've experienced that, you have someone else that's going through literally the exact same thing with you with whom you can commiserate. 
And and so that becomes for me sort of the gig, right? When no one else is paying attention to you, you pay attention to each other, you have some fun. And actually sometimes that can, you know, draw a reaction out of someone as long as you're doing it in a, you know, mildly appropriate way. But when you're alone, well, nobody to turn to and kind of give that knowing smile. Yeah. So I made a decision that in my personal journey and growth as a performer, I was going to learn what I could from those situations, which is how do I really focus even in nights when you're not getting any audience feedback at all? What, what can I take from those moments, those performances to just so I can grow? Yeah. You know, Mary Ellen, who I sing with has such an amazing voice. She changes rooms. Like people turn around and go, Holy cow. Right. Yeah. Her, her voice is that amazing. And, um, I don't have that. My connection point is when people want to listen to the story and, you know, that I'm inhabiting and trying to sing, uh, you know, right. sing a story. Right? right. That's when I'm most effective. Right. I'm not blessed with a, you know, a perfect voice. She is. And, you know, I've seen it happen. Like we'll, we'll play a room that's not supposed to be a music room and people will like, holy cow, that that's like a professional singer. Right. And you know, not only, not only that, one with texture, you know, not like, you know, there's a lot of textbook perfect voices totally but they don't all com- convey emotion right? right some of them are pitch perfect or tone perfect but they're not getting the story told and and Mary Ellen definitely does that and and you know that's part of my learning is that's not going to be me so i better figure out what is my strength and so you know i try to pick gigs where i can exploit my strength but if i get a gig because i want a gig you know it, it's all in your head so this issue about being lonely the, the it, the one time when it's really un, unfathomable to me is like I said, restaurant gigs where I can't even hear myself. Yep. That's really difficult. Yep. But this, you know, this hotel gig I did huge room sound system sounded great. You know, I filled up space with music and you know, there were some people who are, you know, nice about it and a couple of people clued in and you kind of like, what is it about what I'm doing? That's connecting with those people. And You know, part of it is the ego. There are people in that bar that are, they're on a business trip and they're socializing. They're never going to listen to me. They might not even listen to Mary Ellen. I mean, I don't know. Right. Right. No, (laughs) but you know, there there are, there is a point where the dynamics, you know, are what they are. And, you know, even great music isn't going to, you know, change that. Um, No, well, we've, I mean, we've all experienced that. It's the thing that I think most about when walking into playing a private party, Where, you know, how much does the host really know about what their crowd wants? Because sometimes you walk in most of the time, in fact, and people want to, you know, have cocktail hour for an hour and a half before there's loud music. And and a lot of times I've been asked to start playing, you know, 30 minutes after an event starts. And I always say, look, it's your your call. But let's feel the room out together. Uh, You know, we're here. Well, happy to start whenever you want, but we also have some experience with this and we don't want to drive your people out. And and you're right. There's some times where, you know, waiting, whatever, an hour, 30 minutes, whatever it is to play, people have gotten through whatever that is, you know, the, the meeting that they were having or, or, you know, seeing people that they hadn't seen in a while. They need to get through that before they're ready yeah. to turn their attention and, and stop listening to other people. I remember years ago, I went to a party at CES, so the, the hugest trade show of, of huge trade shows, CES. Yeah. And there are these big, lavish parties. And one of the parties, one of the companies hired Natalie Cole to play gig. So name yeah. entertainer, right? Sure. You could not hear a word she was singing because people were talking so loud, right? Oh. So remember, this is someone who's you know pretty well-known performer and pretty a very well talented known. person as well, right? And she's basically going through that same thing. Like- not everybody in that room was a Natalie Cole fan. Right. Everybody in that room was there on a business trip and schmoozing, socializing, you know, having their own personal agenda that they were exploring. Uh, yeah. And that that is helpful to me that like that's that's part of the deal. You know, you know, Bruno Mars may change a room. Right. Yeah. Just sheer cult of personality, you know, will own a room. Yeah, Charisma and there has are, a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. And, uh, you know, and he's also the hottest thing on the planet right now. When you're not the hottest thing on the planet, you know, in, in 20 years, when Bruno Mars gets offered that CES gig and someone else is the hottest thing on the planet, will it still be the same 
you know, same thing. So, huh. so, you know, that's this is just part really, of the journey. That's an interesting thing to think about because that's what happens with those types of that's games. That's what happens. It's people yeah. that are, you know, usually kind of on the, on the, uh, I don't want to say the downslope of their career. Well, but you're hired because you have some name recognition yeah. and the company can claim they have big name talent. You got it. That's right. Yeah. So, but, but that informs, you know, my journey. Right. And, and hopefully it'll help somebody out there. But, you know, that question about loneliness is a really interesting one. I think that's by nature, you know, it's, it's probably by nature, something that resonates with most musicians. You know, you are a musician because you have a certain amount of need to go internal and get, get some emotion out yep. of you via music yep. that's that by definition is a lonely endeavor it's a joyful endeavor but you know it's a solitary <laughs> well, endeavor right it's it's joyful if you can succeed at getting that emotion out it's very frustrating when you go do all the things you thought you were going to do and it's all still stuck in there yeah and that you know that's as you said it that really resonated me with me because that's exactly what I was talking about at the beginning of the show when we were talking about, you know, the, the I didn't say I was lonely in the pit, but it was frustrating not being able to connect with my fellow performers in that way. Right. And that's for me an emotional thing. And it's exactly the same. Yeah. So I, let, let me finish the thought yeah. here. And that is the other side of it. Yes, there is a loneliness component of it. And that's those are the dynamics of it. For me, I'm finding actually the solo stuff is like, I love the teamwork of a band and my trio, but literally in the solo stuff where I control everything, I control the sound, I control the song repertoire. I control the expression. It's all on me. I like that. And so it's also the most rewarding. So, so in that, there's no, <laughs> there's no compromise going on. I can see every that. decision is mine and every decision I own and every success is mine and every challenge. And again, if you're going to let challenges cripple you, then it's lonely. If you're going to get your head to a productive space where the challenges are learning experiences and it's all a growth and it's all a path, you can actually turn that stuff into, you know, powerful teaching moments, you know, for lack of a better word. Where yeah. you take take what you can and you know build on it and you know next time do it better, and that, that makes and total that, so, sense. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it is the most rewarding and it is the most exposing. You know, yeah. when when a band has a train wreck, it's a band problem, right? Right. Even if even if you were if, if it was entirely your fault or at least partially your fault for the train wreck, or if if it wasn't your fault at all, uh, you you sort of own that collectively. And and in most bands and most of the time, everybody sort of, you know, circles the wagons and it's like, yep. All right. We'll, we'll figure this out together. And yep. and you alone get to figure that out together when it's just you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Truth. Yeah. Huh. That makes perfect sense. So, yeah. Yeah. Your tolerance for frankly, for failure. Right. Is is yeah. is a big part of this. Are you are you OK with failing to learn to succeed? And, and really, you're in the wrong business. You're, you're in the wrong hobby if you if you have no tolerance for failure. You know, if if it's going to cripple you, you're going to not be able to go on. But if you're going right. to say, "Uh, oh, you know, I flubbed that passage," it means ten more hours in the woodshed. Yep. That's the most productive thing you can do, right? And then yep. that's so rewarding when you get it right. It's so rewarding when you get it right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or rewarding when you find out that somebody else is skipping measures that that uh, that you're not. So, you know. <laughs> well, they, they had the wrong book, man. They, they had the wrong that's book. That's right. It's just the wrong book. Ah, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, this is a good one. I love I love episodes like this where we have all these topics that are that seem very different, and yet when we get to the end, it's like we actually just talked about the same thing for you know forty five minutes. So well, dude, three years we haven't run out of stuff to talk about yet. I, seems, I really enjoy our weekly check ins. I I do too. It's uh, it's great. And it's great to know that uh, you folks out there enjoy them, too. Uh, as Definitely. always, you know, feel free to find us on uh, Facebook. You can go to giggabpodcast.com slash Facebook. That's the easiest way to get there. We'll we'll direct you to the, the weird URL. And uh, and of course, you can send us email to uh, to feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's all I got for this week, Paul. Good one, man. You got one more thing to share with them? Any one one oh, yeah. lasting got, bit of advice? I've got one thing, man. What's that? Always be performing. Oh, that's a great idea. From even the same book. Even when you're alone, from the same book. <laughs> See you next week. Late.